Thank you very much. Um, we are going to give the lecturer a few minutes to respond to these questions. Okay. Um, do you mind if I see it? Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Okay. And the first question is um, the role of discipleship in nation building. Um, my understanding of your question, if I'm right, if I'm not, please let me know. I will take discipleship to mean mentorship. Um, we are all, we sit in our various congregations, fellowships, and we take, we feed from the, from our various pastors. So we're being discipled. Now, to build a nation, what I'm hearing you say is, what is the role of mentorship in the things of God about nation building? Would that represent your question? Not totally. What's, what's discipleship? I'm, I'm just, it's the word. Really. Yes, uh, discipleship is mentorship. Mentorship. Yes. But I'm saying, I'm saying, we know for a fact that churches are trying in that area. Discipleship, but we're not doing enough. That's where I'm going. Okay, because sir. if we are doing enough, it should reflect in what Christians do wherever they find themselves. But it's not reflecting. You know, um, a lot of us, we, we are put to point to leadership. When we say this, there are issues in the life. So we blame the president, we blame the senior president, we blame the government. But then we should also, we point one finger of accused to somebody, they say four others are pointing at you. So my point is this, if we make, take a conscious decision that we want good people in government, they will get it. In fact, statistics have it. The voting population, let's even pack the church and let's look at the demography of the, um, of the country. The youth population can elect a president. Then the majority from age 18 to 45. Just leave the rest of the older generation, they will elect the president. So if we say the youth are unemployed, we said the youth are not are getting the rough uh, end of the stick. If the youth can come together and say enough is enough, and they look amongst themselves, or they even look to the older and look for those men with character, with integrity, with purpose, they will elect. So the same problem we have in the larger society is what we have in the body. You go to fellowship on Sunday, honestly, I can speak from my own position. You then wonder what, why do people come for this fellowship? I was in a service one day, and one brother perched beside me, and he was uh, he was pitching for a job. He was marketing his produce to me. I want to supply this contract. I want to do that. The message was going on. So what sort of discipleship do we get when our heart is not tuned even to the message that we have come to listen to? So it's the men of God are doing their, their best. But those of us receiving the word, are we really in that place to receive the word? Sometimes, and I'm sorry for the women folks, I, with all apologies, I have a wife, so I... Sometimes we're going to church and I'm checking my time. It's running late and somebody is doing some parking. I ask my wife sometimes and I'm sorry, don't tell her. Why are we going to church? Is it a fashion parade? So sometimes people come to show off what. So if you get to those congregations, what we call church today, by our own better uh, definition of church, it's also people are there to try their trade. People are there to, to, to make connection and contact. Some people are there because they have arrived. 
they just bought the latest car. So they they will they are the first to get to church that day. But they want a vantage position to park so that when they come out of the car, you will see them. And when they are going, you will see them. So as much as we talk about leadership, discipleship also has its own flaws. Um clearly our brother did some mathematics here. That the population of atheists or pagans, whatever name you want to call them, is the minority. Very, very interesting. So many clerics uh, who profess the faith of Islam, profess the faith of Christianity, can almost equate to 100 percent. That the followership of those clerics can almost equate to 100 percent. So why are we saying Christians are not participating? Now. My question goes back to what I have said. Now, if you say you want to participate, it, 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 you know, the word says by their fruit, you shall know them. It's not the label you wear. It's not the lapel you wear. I work for Wemer Bank, and I have the lapel of Wemer Bank, but then do I believe the Wemer values and the Wemer principles? So you profess to be a Christian, a member of this fellowship, a member of that ministry. But what comes out of you? Is it really Christian life? Or is it uh, Muslim life? I don't know. So it's not about labor. It's not about attendance. It's not about a membership. You know, you know what it is today? The fact is to say, I'm a Christian. If you are not one, people are watching. So where are you? But being a Christian doesn't mean you live the life of a Christian. So who are we talking about here? We're not talking about the identity we carry more like a social symbol. We're talking about people who genuinely, that is, you go in there, the day you want to go and vote, and you say, what am I voting for? I'm not voting for this is your tribal, uh, tribal sentiment. I'm not voting because it's my next door neighbor. I'm voting because this individual, I'm convinced and I know he will deliver. That's what we do not have. So if you cut the citizenship, the population into, into two, you have Muslim on one side, almost half, Muslim Christian on the other side, almost half. So when we say we are participating, so my brother is a Christian, he was a senator. So you we say we have a Christian. But it's not that legal side. What it will mark him out is what he does. The way he lives his life there, the impact he's able to make on the lives of other people. That's what matters, whether he's a Christian or not. So what we're saying sir, is that we don't have enough. We don't have enough of people genuinely and made up their mind that if I die there, I die. But this is what I stand for. I want to profess Christ and, the, and my faith during this assignment. And what are the other? There are just so many things. Some temptation, a whole lot of evil attraction when you are in a position of authority. Are you able to say, count me out? I'm not going to be there. Are you in Nehemiah who says, in spite of the fact that this is my entitlement, I let it go. I won't touch the bread. I won't touch the drink. I don't want to put additional body on the people and they let it go. You see, a lot of things that we acquire, honestly, if people really sit back and think about it, it's, it's, not, it's not worth all the effort, the sacrifice, and mortgaging our lives and our future that we give to them. Somebody gave an example. And I'm sorry I use this example, I don't, with no disrespect, but just to illustrate the point. When a bachelor died, he was going to be flown from Abuja to Kano for burial. They put the cops together. You know where they put him? In the luggage compartment. I wish if, I, if the dead can see what treatment they were given, maybe they will. A lot, a lot of us think, you know, for the money that was at his disposal, someone said the plane was, the luggage compartment was closed. 
And someone said, gentlemen, let's respect the office of the head of state. This man was our president. We should put him inside the plane and not in that, in that, in that place. So a lot of things that we mortgage our faith to get, they are not worth it. How can genuine Christians navigate the challenges of getting to, and to elected offices? Honestly, if we don't take a stand and we pronounce enough is enough, this will continue to be our excuse. The same way I address the youth, I will address us as the body of Christ, even at different churches, in at different fellowships. We decide and genuinely decide that we want to put men of God, people who have the fear of God in authority. Nobody can change it. So, meaning that, and there's a whole lot of wisdom that goes into this. The politicians, the so called, the people who call on God, they are smarter. And the Bible says so. Sorry, at the grassroots, when they are forming this political um, association, where are we? I imagine if we get involved at that level. So they want to pick the chairman. We will be the one who is the chairman. And if we are genuinely Christian, I'm not going to demand from you 10 million before I give you a nomination. For me, at the last stage, we want to hold contest. It's not going to work. So it's start from the grassroots. So we make a conscious effort from today to say in 2019, we'll do it together. And then what it requires for you to join, party join, what it requires to, for you to influence who the leadership of the parties are, you do. But if you fold your hands, I will say corruption in the land, the uh, juju that they use, uh, in fact, assassination that is almost the the, the, the story in politics. I don't want to have a part in it. You leave it to them. So you have no, no reason to complain. So if you want to get there, we start from the beginning. Thank you. I want you to turn to page seven of your lecture. Paragraph two it says, I quote in part, going by the constitution of Nigeria, the route to governance is through the electoral process. How will the righteous be in authority if they refuse to go into the political arena? And this is the statement that I consider most the author says, I would like to submit that the church should not and cannot stay out of politics and expect a good nation. Ladies and gentlemen, the first president in the history of man was in the Bible, his name is Moses. He was the president that liberated Israel out of bondage. There's no constitution in the whole world that does not have its root in the Ten Commandments. Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, introduced the concept of filtration and he introduced the parliament. Management by representation. And that is the first theory of delegation. Joseph was the first economic advisor. And he was the one that gave the world the solution to food security. Yet, there's food poverty in Nigeria. Jesus held cabinet meetings. And he gave territories to his disciples. Nehemiah was a governor. So we are not seeing governorship for the first time. It's in the Bible. Esther was the first first lady. 
So the concept of first lady is not anybody's innovation. It was given by God. And we knew what Esther did with the office of the first lady. Daniel stood in faith. And he respected his oath of office. And he got a reward. Jesus paid tax. And he even visited tax collectors. So he understood that public finance is the foundation of public finance is in taxation. So it's not new. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus addressed rallies. The Sermon on the Mount and his Beatitudes was his manifesto. So Jesus was a politician. And I can go on and on and on. So for Christians who says politics is not for me, it's for them. You are denying your right to take dominion over territories that has been given to you. The bottom line is that nature and God are both a vacuum. The leadership of nations is embedded in its constitution. And there is a contest for this space called leadership of nations, where the righteous should rule so that the people can rejoice. It is your choice to occupy that space. If the church refuses to occupy, we have seen that that position can never be vacant and it will be occupied by people from outside the church. The truth of the matter is, I haven't listened to everything here today, and I submit, God has given the church to the world. It's a universal gift. But revelation is personal. It is what is revealed to you, and you are inspired to do, and that you do, that will become your testimony. The nation is available for the church to take if there are enough people of revelation. Because the message of dominate is for all. But the revelation of it is for a few. In the generations of Nehemiah, he stood out, out of several. No wonder Paul said, come out from amongst them and be what? Different and be separate. All I know is for me, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And it is up to you to let that light shine. The message has been preached. The admonition has been done. The prophetic utterance has taken place, laying of hands have taken place, anointing has taken place. It is up for us, like businessmen say, to provide the offtake for that which heaven has established. I ask you to rise up to destiny and fulfill it so that your children and your children's children can have a legacy that puts rulership in the hands of the children of God. I thank you very much for listening. I wish you stay Thank you very much, sir. Um, we are gradually wrapping up. Just one of the things to do. Um, I'm going to call the great servant of the Lord, our mother in Israel, uh, the one that has and is still impacting lives in so many ways, uh, to do the will of thanks. Praise the Lord. Um, once again, I want to 
sincerely appreciate everyone who has taken our time to come for this inaugural annual public lecture. And I'm very sure that we have all been well impacted. And my prayer is that what we have learned will not end in this place. You won't forget it as soon as you get out of this door. I pray that we will make use of all these things we have learned. If I may just say one or two things before I present the plans. Um, like Dr. Ann said when she was asked that question, she said something profound. The Lord has made the church a prototype of what the world should look like. He has made us a holy nation, a peculiar people, to show forth his glory. And uh, don't forget that the church is not a congregation. The church starts with you. I hope somebody is listening to me. Church starts with you as an individual. So when we are talking about the role of a church in nation building, please don't look at Abundant Life Church, don't look at Deeper Life, don't look at Redeem, look first to yourself. You are the church. What role do you have to play in nation building? Now, when you play your role, you play your role, we all play our roles, then we can say the church is actually playing a role in nation building. God expects us to shine as light wherever we are. Now, I always say this in church. When we come together in church, we are hundreds and sometimes thousands. But as soon as we get out of church and everybody fizzles into the crowd, you hardly find the church. So please, as from today, anywhere you find yourself, let your light shine. Like Senator Adetubi said, let your light shine in darkness. And the light will continue to shine brighter and brighter. And before you know it, the whole nation will be lightened up in Jesus' name. Amen. Secondly, the church is our various church organizations. And I want to say this to every man and woman of God here today, and some of us who are just church members as we go back, let's encourage things done from our various churches. I mean, like the, uh, the, the Mr. Lokiti said, I actually wrote it down, 1960, from that, I think in page seven or so, mission hospitals were much more than government hospitals. Is that not something to go home with? 118 mission hospitals as against 101 government hospitals. And um, by the grace of God, like you are bred in the brochure, in the next few years, we are putting up a, an ultra-modern maternity hospital. So God's I mean, it has been a dream for years. Because as a pastor, we have a lot of people come to church with needs. You know, they can't even pay hospital bills. And they are running from pillar to post. God will help us. That's why we need your contribution. It's not a matter of one person. It's not, it's not, it's not a thing of one person taking the glory. It's a thing of the whole church taking the glory. So if the Lord bless you, please be a part of this great thing that the Lord is doing. And let's endeavor to do small, small things in our various corners that will give glory to the Lord. Let me hear an amen here. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then in, the, in page 8, it is written, our role as a church. Please go back and take note of those rules. Governance, getting involved in the grassroots administration, intercession, building, and prophetic. I want to plead with every church. Let us stand to declare the prophetic word of the Lord over our nation. Not condemning and, and uh, criticizing. Law, the Bible says we come out of Zion. In Abana Life Church, every Sunday morning, immediately after praise and worship, we spend time to pray for a nation. And I tell people, you can't be praying for a nation and you are con condemning the same nation. You can't be praying that things should go well and you are saying, no, oh, everything is bad concerning the nation. God has anointed our voices, our mouths. And as we prophesy good things to this nation, it will happen. Yeah. I tell people everywhere, I say Nigeria will be good. Yeah. I say it everywhere I go. I was in Israel not long ago and we had a chat with some people there. I said, look, Nigeria is changing. Amen. It will change. As we continue to say it, God will make it come to pass. Yeah. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. So not a little bit said, the nation is available for the church to take. Take that home. The nation is available for you, for me, for the church to take. And we will take it in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, thank you very much for coming, everyone. And um, I pray that this time you have spent, we'll come back to you multiple folds in Jesus' name. Amen. Specifically for 
our guests today. We have plaques and um, a few things to just give to them, just to appreciate them. I mean, we can't pay for the time. Uh, Mr. Ashet, we look at you, you have spent here. I know he's a very busy man, so we want to really appreciate your coming. Uh, we don't have time to display all these plaques, but I can assure you, they are good plaques. We, you, we want to keep by your bedside. <laughs> to keep looking at it every second because it's not just a plaque, it's anointed. Amen. And um, it, will, it will take you places. Thank you very much, sir. Please let's give it a hand. Pastor Igo Orienu. Yeah, one of our wonderful discussions. Thank you very much, sir, for coming. We love you, sir. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, for Senator Adetumbi, we appreciate it. It's, it's, it's our own. Uh, but we want to appreciate you for coming. And um, my prayer is that, and I pray this prayer this morning, that the Lord will give you more room to express His grace on your life Amen. over this nation. Because I know you are so you are, you are so loaded. And uh, who says you can't be the president of Nigeria? Can I prophesy that to you? Too? Who says you can't be? Because I know if you, if you get there, I mean, the, the, you have told us that the nation is waiting for the church to take. I pray that God will give you more room to, 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 to release what God has placed in you. Because there's a lot there we have not started yet. We make that declaration today in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Please don't mind the, the way it is going. Dr. Ann Okorafo, I want to appreciate this young woman, not young woman, I know you are looking at she didn't have much time to talk. But I tell you, she's loaded. She works in the presidency in Abuja. She's been with him all the way from Abuja today. I pray that we'll have more time to have you. Thank you very much for having me. God bless you. Thank you so much. And um, of course, she's a medical doctor. If you need um, cancer, you can see her. And you will pay me, I will be the... Yeah. the <laughs> of course, the chairman of the board of trustees. Well, you may say we don't have to really give him anything because he's our host, he's the one that gathered us together. But um, I'm sure you know he doesn't live in Nigeria. He lives in the UK and he flew here just for this purpose. We really appreciate him. And I'm saying this here again with every sense of responsibility that we appreciate you, sir. You have not, he is a politician to the core. I'm telling you, Adam. I pray that. Uh, 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 I have to take permission from Liberty Church before I pray this prayer. <laughs> okay. I pray that the Lord will also give you the room to express yourself in this nation. Let me tell you, we have, we have people. Who will lead this nation and lead this nation right? We have them. We have them. God will give them room Amen. in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everybody here today, we appreciate our big daddy. He's our daddy, Bishop Michael Kumpo there. You know, kingdom life is going on right now. So he's very busy. Said to him, sensitive. Mommy even said she was going to send something. I said, Mommy, don't worry. I mean, he will stand for daddy and mommy. Uh, please help us to. And let me also say that Bishop Ogunko sent us a check for this foundation. He does that every time. That's a father. He sent us a check for this foundation and uh, we appreciate it. Please help us extend our, our gratitude to him. And um, I want to thank everyone uh, here today. Please don't forget to fill your sleep. It doesn't matter how small your contribution is. On Sunday, we are, we are commissioning a borehole in one of the streets near the church. Let me say this. When the borehole was uh, dug and uh, the water was, the first day the water was pumped, you need to see how the children and everybody in that neighborhood screaming and shouting and excited. I mean, we can't leave everything for our nation to do. We can also do something. So your contribution will be well um, appreciated and accepted. The Lord bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise Thank the Lord. You.